church mother in a church hat clap man that sugar gave her color purple coming back uh when that whole week beat you up and stress you but you hear that organ playing and it remind you of your blessings and on another note she just hit another note chills down my spine got me crying make me overload
we give you all the honor. And God, we give you all the praise. One more time, put your hands together and let's welcome in, let's usher in. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy. Happy resurrection to you. Good morning and God bless you. If you're watching us by YouTube or by Facebook, we want to welcome here via live to the Miracle Center Christian Church in Ventura, California. Listen, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through, but I want you to know right now that God is getting ready to turn everything around. He's getting ready to turn your mourning into dancing. He's getting ready to turn your sorrows into joy because that is the resurrecting power. One more time, put your hands together and let's give him some praise. Hallelujah. Are you guys ready to worship? Are you guys ready to worship? Listen, the Bible says that no rock will cry out for me. Do I have anybody that's got a praise louder than any inanimate object? Do I have anybody with a praise that they can lift from the bottom of their toes all the way up to the heavens? Do I have any praises in the house? All right, then I hope you guys are ready to praise. But before we do that, let's open up this service with prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open up this service, we dedicate this time of devotion and worship and praise to you, God. We thank you in advance that your spirit is going to meet us right here where we are. As we sing praises and sing worship and we set this atmosphere, God, we are setting this atmosphere for you to move. We're creating this atmosphere and we're making it susceptible for your presence, God. Anything that you want to do in this service, God, you have free roam and will to do. We move ourselves aside and we say, have your way this uh, morning, God. Lord, as people are coming in, we thank you in advance for traveling mercies. And we thank you that nobody in this room will leave the same than when they first came. And for this, we give you all the praise. For this, we give you the honor. For this, we acknowledge you. We recognize you. And we say we thank you in advance for everything that you've done, everything that you will do, for the doors you've opened, for the ways you made. You are a good God, and you are greatly to be praised. We love you, and we thank you. And all of God's people in the room said amen. Amen, amen, amen. Put your hands together, church. Let's do it, team. Good morning, Miracle Center. Hey! Got great people in here today. Hallelujah. Woo! Put your hands together. Hands up. It's the reason that I praise. It's a celebration. Yeah. Every time I hear your name, I've got this revelation Ooh. of all you've done for me. You set my soul on fire. Hey. And it's the reason.
gonna cry in my place.
a couple reasons to praise him. Let me give you something. Is that all right? I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. I'll praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. I'll praise because there's nobody greater than you. Say. that your praise has the power to shake some things up, to cause dead things to come back to life. We're making bones rattle with our praise. We're making situations rattle with our praise. We're making circumstances rattle with our praise. Where are my praisers at in the room? Hallelujah. Woo. We give you praise, oh God. Woo. There's nobody like you. Saturday was silent, and surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? And Friday's disappointment, the Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? The sound of dry bones rattling. And this is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Let me hear some praise. 
entire building to get on one accord. We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're talking about the Savior, the Deliverer, the Redeemer. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Jesus. How many of you know that the king, he went to Calvary because he thought that you were worth saving? Woo. Thank you, Lord.
changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. You sacrificed your life so I could be for you if you want to come down. You thought I was to die for. That's why you sacrificed your life.
sacrifice your life so I could be so I could be I'm gonna tell everyone I know thank God I'm free the deepest part of my soul and I say hallelujah God you've been so good God you've been so good where are my worshipers at do I have anyone that can testify that he's been so good hallelujah you sacrificed your life so I could be room give him some glory all over this room give him some praise all over this room lift your voice hallelujah hallelujah do me a favor church can you just turn to your neighbor and tell them one thing that he's brought you through just one thing go to somebody that you didn't come with somebody that you may not know and just tell them one thing that God has done for you one door that he's opened one window that he's opened one way that he's made one way that he changed your life We want to welcome all first-time guests to the Miracle Center Church, where you are not a visitor, but you are a gift. Have a free cup of coffee on Pastor Lonnie and Dr. K in the foyer. If you're watching for the first time online, please text first time to 805-261-4445. We have a gift for you. All married couples, we are shoring up the foundation for the long haul. Join MCC Couples Connect. Text MC Connect C to 805-261-4445. If you have a team, we have an exciting and active teen ministry that builds and equips teens with confidence to spread the gospel to their peers. Check out their Instagram page for more information at MCC Youth VTA. Join us Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. on our Facebook and YouTube channels for online Bible study. It's a one hour investment of your time to learn Bible principles for lifelong victory. And here are more ways you can connect with us through simple texting. If you are in need of community resources, we can help. Text help me to 805-261-4445. Thank you for joining us. And once again, welcome to the Miracle Center. Expect a miracle. Are you guys expecting a miracle? Didn't sound like it. <laughs> Come on, if you're expecting a miracle, give God some praise. All right. Happy Resurrection Day, everybody. It is a good day to be alive. How do you guys like the new format with the uh, announcements? I think it worked pretty good. I'm wondering who that smooth voice was that was making those announcements, but uh, I think it was Solomon. <laughs> There's a story behind that. That's why I'm bringing that up. Well, welcome, everybody. Do we have anybody here for the first time? All right. Well, we'll, we'll get, yes, greet them, yes, yes, yes. 
Well, we're going to prepare for our morning tithes and offering. And how many of you are ready to give to the Lord this morning? How many of you are ready to participate in worship to the Lord? Because truly our giving is a form of worship. Now, when I was growing up, they used to have a saying, you know, I'm, I'm in my 60s now, so some of you may not believe that, but uh, back in the day, we used to have a saying that you can't beat God's giving. How many of you remember that? Old enough to remember. A couple of us. <laughs> Is that you can't beat God's giving no matter how you try. Some people don't really try, but that's okay. <laughs> but you can't. If you try, try as you might, because here's the, the, the wonderful thing about God. <clears throat> God has given us already the greatest gift that he could ever give us. And it was the gift of his son, Jesus. And that's why we're here to celebrate this morning. Because the Bible says that God demonstrated his love. He didn't just tell us. He didn't just say it. He demonstrated his love. And that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. I'm telling you, that is good news. And I'm telling you, I don't care how much you try, you can never, ever outgive God. Never. So we're going to prepare for our tithe and offering. If you need a tithe envelope, just lift your hands. We have multiple ways to give. Ushers, if you want to bring the, the buckets down here. But if you lift your hands, if you're giving by envelope, the ushers will get one to you. You could also give by Cash App and through our Miracle Center app. So when you're ready, I'd like everybody to stand to your feet and we're going to make our declaration. And let's make our declaration. Ready, begin. Heavenly Father, as I prepare to cheerfully give to you, I thank you for your overwhelming love and for giving so much to me and my household. As a citizen of your kingdom, you have given me rights, privileges, and promises. I stand on them now in the name of Jesus. I trust you will take my giving as an act of love and give back to me, pressed down, shaken together with the cup of running over grace. I decree and declare it will flow back to me unhindered and undisturbed. I receive your blessing so that I can be a blessing to advance the kingdom of God on earth. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Put your hands together and give God praise. When you're ready to give, just come on down and tap the bucket. I'm going to acknowledge a few people who are giving online. Just come on down and just tell God as you tap and say, thank you for your gift. Mary Montalago, God bless you. Tony Chumash, we see you. God bless you. Yvette Gross, God bless you for being obedient. Amen, amen. You cannot be God giving. Raquel Ramirez, God bless you. Janita Garcia, God bless you. All right. Oh, I guess I should do. I guess I should give. Hold on. There we go. All right, so I think now we're going to be ministered to. Did, did everybody get a chance to give? All right, okay, thank you. I believe we are now going to be ministered to by our teen dance ministry. So give them a big hand to praise, amen.
And this morning we celebrate the name of Jesus. We celebrate Jesus because he was resurrected. Can you make some noise in here for the name of Jesus? 
You have the victory because of Jesus. Can you release a victory shout because of Jesus? Come on, lift it up in this place this morning. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus. Now put your hands together for the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Yes, you may have your seats. You may have your seats. Good morning. Happy Easter to you. Happy Resurrection Day to you. I want to ditto the team, their welcomes to you, the, the, uh, the um, welcome announcements. I want to ditto all that this morning. We welcome you to the Miracle Center. And if you are first time here, I saw some of you raise your hands. We want you to know that we thank you for coming to visit with us and being our gift this morning. You're a gift, and we want to welcome you to the Miracle Center. On the count of three, I want our whole team, you know what to do, our whole team, our family here, our church family, to welcome them. Welcome to the Miracle Center. Expect a miracle. You guys ready? One, two, three. That's for you. That's for all our first-time guests this morning on site and online, and we have a special guest for you. We have greeters that will be out in our lobby. They have big, warm hearts. They love you. They're excited that you're here this morning, and they prepared something special for you. So we want you to meet them out in our lobby, and also text 805-261-4445. Why do we ask you to text that? Because we want to support you every day in your journey called life. Sometimes life gets hard and we want to support you. And how we do that is by connecting with you. So you have to text 805-261-4445 and text first time and we'll get some information to you. Now, if you've not been in church in a while, if you haven't been in church in a little while, I want to clarify some things. I want to clarify some confusion and misconception about what we do as a church here at the Miracle Center. So I got to clarify because there's a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot of misinformation about the church because the enemy doesn't want you in a place like this on Sunday morning. He doesn't want you here, but you made it. Say, I made it. Now listen, the enemy won't fight you going to the park on Sunday mornings. He won't fight you going to the beach on Sunday mornings. The enemy won't even fight you going to work on Sunday mornings but he will fight you coming to a place like this because the enemy knows better than some of you the power of the church. He knows when you come in a place like this, you're gonna be equipped to fight. He knows when you come in a place like this, you're gonna be positioned for healing. So he's gonna fight you coming to a place like this on a Sunday morning, but you made it. So this morning I want to, because the enemy will fight you, with misconceptions and misinformation about what the church does, I want to clear that up this morning by sharing who we are and what we believe here at the Miracle Center. See, at the Miracle Center, we believe you must acknowledge the need of Jesus and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior to secure eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Once you do that, you become a, the part of the family of God. And at this church, we are one big family. At this church, we are the family of God. We call it a church family. Amen. And our family is an extension of your family. That means your family's not perfect, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> How many have a perfect family? Nah. And the church isn't a perfect family. But here at the Miracle Center, we have strong connections with one another. We have strong connections with one another. We care for one another. We value each other. And we value the gifts that we bring to the table. And here at this church, we have a fearless leader called Pastor Lonnie. He's a fearless leader because he teaches when the battles of life comes, his teachings teach you how to be battle ready. That's what he teaches. And we have countless testimonies 
in our church where people's lives have been transformed and people who are hearing the teachings, how they were able to stand strong in the battle, not just to stand, but to wait to get to their victory. And that's what Pastor Lonnie teaches here. And then if you haven't been here on a Sunday morning, every Sunday morning you get a little something, something extra called God wants you healthy and God wants you whole. <laughs> Say, God wants me healthy and God wants me whole. So why do I teach that? Because God showed me that the Bible was written for every aspect of your life, including your health. Proverbs 4.22 says God's word works like medicine, and God is showing me how the scriptures in the Bible, they work as instructions for health. For example, have you guys heard that verse of scripture, Ephesians 4.26, that says don't go, don't stay angry. It says don't stay angry, don't go to bed angry. That's a verse of scripture in the Bible. And that verse of scripture has instructions for health. Did you know when you are always angry and you're always fussing about something, it opens the door to sickness and disease. Yes. When you are always angry, it opens the door to issues like high blood pressure, heart problems, autoimmune disease, stomach issues, dementia, and even cancer. Listen, holding on to anger and bitterness is so bad that they now include forgiveness therapy and cancer treatment. And what they have found is when people are in unforgiveness, it can slow the pro progress and interfere with cancer treatment. So we get instructions in the Bible, Ephesians 4.26, don't be angry, let it go. There's another verse of scripture in the Bible that we talk about all the time at this church. Psalms 47, one says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Well, inside of that verse of scripture, there's a prescription, there's instructions for health. At this church, we know that when God wired the hands, he wired the hands to connect to the organs of the body through neural pathways. When we come in church and we're celebrating, we clap our hands. We are stimulating the organs of the body for health. There's scriptures. In these scriptures, there's instructions for health. When you shout to God with a voice of triumph, you saw people down here at the altar. They were shouting hallelujah. People standing next to you are shouting hallelujah. When they shout, they are increasing intrathoracic pressure that allows the immune system to work because the intrathoracic pressure pumps lymphatic fluid through the body and it stimulates the immune system. So when you come in this place and you clap your hands and you shout, you are being positioned for health and the enemy doesn't like that. So just for fun, can you put your hands together and stimulate the organs in your body? Come on, just for fun, shout, God is a healer. Now listen, the scriptures in the Bible give instructions for health. Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't disregard coming to church. Don't disregard coming to church. Research, science research shows that people who go to church on a regular basis, not every now and then, not every Easter Sunday, <laughs> but every Sunday on a regular basis, research shows that they live healthier and they live longer. This is what the science research says. And Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't disregard coming to church. It's because when you come to church and you connect with other people like we're about to do, it releases hormones in the body. The hormones are called dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. When you connect with people, it releases these hormones that support mental and physical health. So what I want to do, I know you guys have already greeted, you guys have already spoke to one another, but I want us, because you're here this morning, let's activate the hormones for health. I want you to stand to your feet, give me some background music, and I want you to stand to your feet, and this is what I'd like you to do. I'm going to give you a few minutes to activate. 
these hormones because God wants you healthy and God wants you whole. The church is not a hospital. The church is where you are healed. The hospital is where we take care of sick. We don't take care of sick in the church. God wants you healthy. God wants you whole. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, I want you to go find about two or three people. Now, I'm not asking you to do this just to have something to do. We are really stimulating hormones in the body for health. I want you to go find about two or three people, and I want you to introduce yourself to them, and I want you to tell them how you came to know about Miracle Center. If you're a first-time visitor, tell them how you came to know about the Miracle Center. Now listen, if you are a church family here, I want you to introduce yourself to people you don't know, and I want you to tell them what you love about the Miracle Center. So I want you to go ahead and go ahead and break loose right now. You don't need me to give you any prompts. I want you just to go find about two or three people.
on church. Can I get the whole church's hands up? this building. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory. We hear a sound. We hear a sound. There's a rattling I hear in my spirit. There's a rattling. 
you hear it in your relationship, it's because something dead is coming alive. If there's rattling in your body this morning, it's because something dead is coming to life. Lord, we give you all the praise for the spirit of resurrection. I thank you that today, victory has come to everyone under the sound of my voice. Some of you are going to notice a shift before you get home. Some of you watching by social media, the rattling's taking place. This is going to be the greatest day of the rest of your life. I dare you to clap your hands one last time. seats. Thank you, singers. I want to say, you know, we sing and carry on like this. And some of you, maybe this is your first time here or you haven't been here in a while. Maybe you think it doesn't take all that. Let me just tell you what I know. This is what I know. I don't think this is what I know. A lot of this stuff won't resonate, won't be an anchor to you. The songs, the confessions, the declarations. Maybe they won't in here. Maybe when you're at a football game or a soccer game, they may not even mean anything when you're at work. I understand maybe when you're driving your car, they may not mean anything. Non-significant. Let me tell you something. There's going to come a time in your life when the most important thing is going to be the words that you've heard, the songs that you say. When the doctor looks at you and says, there's nothing else we can do. It's fourth stage cancer. I know what I'm talking about. Every single word, every single opportunity, every song, you're going to be grabbing for those songs, those words for anchors. When you're looking at a relationship and the thing is about to die, or you look at your kids, and the doctor says, I don't know if we can save your kid. I'm going to tell you right now, every single thing, every word that you hear from this pulpit will resonate. You're going to try your best to grab that word, if not from this pulpit, some pulpit. And I'll guarantee you, because you never know the significance and the power and the light of these words until darkness comes in your house. And when it does, let me tell you, if you have nothing to hold on to, no anchors, a sad day it is for you. As I tell people when things are good and just because there's no storms in your life, don't take light on what's going on now. I say often, I don't know a lot about you personally. I don't know the ins and outs of your life. I don't know who's going to stay married. I don't know who's going to get married. I don't know who's going to remarry, who's going to, whose marriage is going to last. I don't know any of that. I don't know if your kids are going to honor you or respect you when they get older. I don't know. You don't even know that. You hope so, but you don't know. I don't know if you're going to stay in this city, community, or move away. You know, I think I know, but I don't know those things. But the only thing I do know is you're going to face a battle one day in your life. I'll guarantee I don't care who you are, I don't care what your ethnic makeup is, I don't care how much money you have or how good you look or how good you think you don't look. You are going to face a battle. Every human being faces battles. And I'm telling you, if you have a dream, I'm assigned to you. I'm here to help your dream come true. I'm here to help get you battle ready. That is my assignment. That is my calling. I'm called to disrupt average. So that at the end of the day, you move from average to amazing because that's what God wants with your life. And if you have a dream, if you have any resemblance of a dream, any resemblance of hope, any res resemblance of anything in you living again and you doing more than anybody in your family's ever done, if there's something in you, I don't care how, what your age is, but if there's something in you still calling and you still feel there's more, I'm called to you. Amen. And if you'll listen closely, I promise you, something will shift in your life so another version of you will come forth. And every human being, I don't care who you are, every human being, we have these embedded things built in us. that They just happen because God wired humans that way. And I'm going to say 
to all of you, and particularly to our team, to my family and everybody, thank you so much for all that you do. And what a great time to say it on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, that uh, many of you who really weren't sure what the weather was going to be, and of course, we in California are so spoiled, to, we, we think bad weather is what we get, but my friends in Chicago and other places, they laugh at us. They don't even like talking about weather because they think we don't know what it is. But uh, I want to thank all of you uh, that work behind the scenes, all of our team. I've, I've learned, uh, it's been 36 some years now, pastoring full time, and I've learned it doesn't really matter um, in your life. If you have a big dream, you're going to need more than a big dream. You're going to need a big team to help with that big dream. And I'm graced to have a big team here to help us. And I want to thank all of our team, and particularly all of you who work behind the scenes. I don't know if you know this, but if you're a leader, you need to understand it's those who work behind the scenes that make it possible for everything to be seen. And I know here we have a lot of people that do that. And I want to thank you all very, very much. There's so many dynamics, so many things that go behind the scene. I think at some point I'm going to do a teaching on the hidden heroes, because we have so many here, and they never get the credit, but without them, we couldn't do what we do. And so all of you, everyone, I want to thank you. One of those hidden heroes, this is her last day as our camera director. You've seen Christy going up and down with the cameras, and there she is right there with the camera. <laughs> Give her a big hand clap. Kirstie, is the, Kirstie has been the director over our cameras for some time now, and she uh, is stepping down as director. And uh, we have a new director, which we'll introduce all those folks later. But I just want to tell you, you've just been an incredible delight. I'm telling you, there's certain people in your life you don't know why. You just are glad you know them. And I'm telling you, you're like that. And you've made an incredible inroad and impact on this ministry and on the team. You've helped rewired things. Thank you. We love you very much. It's an honor to have you. <clears throat> I love uh, seeing people develop and grow. And I have the privilege because I've been in this city all my life. And there's some goods and bads about that. The bad, the bad thing is everybody knows you think, oh, yeah, that's Vivian's boy. They used to live on J Street. And everybody knows you. You hide from nothing. They know you're good, the bad, the ugly. The good thing about that, you don't have to hide from anything. They know who you are. My mother used to tell me when you were a little boy, if you haven't done anything wrong, don't run. So I just stayed in this city all my life. Sometimes you don't understand the impact you're making until you get a testimony. I got one last week from someone who sent a letter, and it touched my heart. And they were in our service a week ago, and, and they said, I want to thank you, Pastor Lonnie for teaching about the first words that come out of your mouth when you talk to your kids in the morning or at night. And I told this person I would never say their name or embarrass some of the kids, but this person said that my parents spoke negative to me every day in the morning and every night before I went to sleep. And when you said in your teaching that the first voice your kids hear in the morning and the last voice they hear at night is the dominant voice, that will shape them throughout the day or throughout the night, I realized I had to make some changes. She goes on to say, I did exactly what you said, and I realized it wasn't easy. But since my voice is the first voice that my child would hear, I was going to say something that was going to lift them up. Pastor Lonnie, I'm amazed how fast, I'm amazed how fast what you said worked. It's only been a few days, and I've seen a change in my child. Amen. <clears throat> well, one of the reasons for that, because the change is not really in your child, it's in you. You're the voice that your child is hearing. And I hope and pray for your child's sake that if you weren't here, you listened to that teaching last week. It's somewhere on one of our social media channels. Because you need to understand the importance of that voice that rings in your kid's head all day, the first voice they hear, and the last voice they hear at night, it will stay in their spirit all night. It will affect how they wake up. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but the key to success, and I'll never forget Oral Roberts, the great Oral Roberts from the Oral Roberts University, who was a spiritual grandfather to me. 
One day we're having dinner, I'll never forget. He leans over to me. He says, I'm going to tell you the secret to being a great minister. He says, it's listening. Wow. Yeah, listening, because whatever you listen to, whatever you hear, will control what you feel. Whatever you feel will control the direction you go in your life. It was sharing to me that the most important thing in people's lives are the voices they trust. Because your life is moving in the direction of the voices that you trust. Not the voices you hear, but the voices you trust to speak into your life. Your life is moving in that direction. And eventually, after you hear the voices, your life goes in the direction of those voices, your life will end up where those voices send you. And unfortunately, because a lot of people don't know that, they have no idea that every choice that they're making is because of the voices that they're hearing. And so I want to encourage you from here out to make sure you pay attention to the voices you trust and make sure you understand that it's important when you're hearing voices. You don't believe me, let me just tell you, the greatest voice ever is God's voice. And God creates this man, and he loved this man called Adam, and he made a wonderful wife for Adam. And they're having this incredible life together, and God blessed them with dominion over the earth. But one conversation, one conversation where they listened to the wrong voice, the voice of the serpent, listening to that one voice changed everything in their world. One voice changed everything. I guarantee you, I don't care how long you've been hearing something, how long you've been going at it, if you trust the wrong voice, it can take everything from you. Everything. In a moment, Adam lost everything. Everything shifted because he chose to listen to the wrong voice. Imagine animals used to talk. We have zoos now because Adam disobeyed God. We wouldn't need a zoo. You wouldn't need cages for animals. All that happened because Adam's disobedience. Do you know how fruit used to grow in trees? Do you know when Adam was in Eden, he would pick a fruit off the tree and another fruit would grow instantly? What a world. But he listened to the wrong voice and he made the wrong choice and he changed everything. I don't know why I'm feeling this. I'm feeling that there's somebody in here that needs to hear this. You have to be careful of the voices you're trusting. I don't care how clever they sound. I don't care how good. I don't even care who it's coming from. You better listen closely to that voice because you are not clever enough to disobey a voice that you trust in your ear. So you have to stop that voice from ringing in your ear. Now, I said all that because I want to share something that's really important. deal with the resurrection, the death of Jesus, but more importantly, I don't want this to just be an Easter Sunday message about an Easter story. I want today for your future to change, and I want each person here to draw from the strength and the strategies that I'm getting ready to share with you, because what I'm going to share with you are some hidden secrets that the scriptures have, and a lot of people don't see these things because most people don't get in the Bible and study with depth. And the Bible says that Jesus himself said that a lot of things in the Bible he put in parables. He sort of hid them just from the casual reader. But he wanted people to seek. It's the seeker that will find. It's the one who knocks that the door will open to. And so I'm going to share some revelation that will help you for the rest of your life and let you know that everything in the Bible is strategic. Nothing is just in there. And when Jesus laid down his life some 2,000 years ago, we're celebrating Easter today. But it was an incredible situation because Jesus promised them, I'm going to die, and then three days later, um, I'm going to come back to life. And that's just incredible even to think about it. So I want us, us to reflect on the significance of not only Jesus' death and resurrection, but beyond an Easter Sunday, even though that's important. But I want everybody to understand how strategic his death was. Now, on the cross, Jesus said seven things. 
And what most people don't know, they think it's just a clever little seven statements. But every statement that he made, seven of them before he died, the last seven words were the most important words to every human being on this planet. And he said those words strategically. And a lot of people don't know that because, again, it's only for the seeker who will find it. But I'm going to share this with you, and I want you to know that in the midst of every single thing that you and I go through, it was on the cross, the last seven words that Jesus uttered on the cross, he was sharing the secret to victory and to success. And he was about to face death, but he was giving coded messages for people to walk in victory. I'm going to give you those seven things real quick from the seven words that Jesus said. And I want you to look at these things because one of the most important things that the cross death did, Jesus dying, Jesus giving his life up, is it released what's called the peace of God. Now just listen to me for a quick second, then I'm going to give you these seven things. And when I talk about the peace of God, I'm not going to get in this part today, but in, there's a scripture in Philippians 4 and verse 6 and 7, and it says the peace of God. It says the peace of God. I want everybody just on this Easter Sunday to shout with me, the peace of God. No, come on, everybody, even, this, even if you don't talk in church, you'll be all right. Nobody's going to hurt you here. I want you to say it out loud. Say the peace of God. Peace of God. I want you to notice it's not your peace. It's not daddy's peace, not your mama's peace. It's not the church's peace. He says something so important. He says, the peace of God will guard your heart. We're going to unpack this next week because this is a two-part series that I want to give you because it is the secret key to manifesting victory quickly. Now, if you haven't been in any storms, you don't understand anything I'm talking about. But I've been in storms. And I'm going to tell you something. When you're in a storm, you're only waiting for one thing, victory to come. Amen. And that victory taking long or coming quick, I had no idea. I had no idea until this revelation was revealed to me that you and I have a lot to do with the speed in which victory shows up. Are you all ready for me this morning? Yes. You and I, when we face something, when we go through something, I don't care what it is. I don't care what is every human. You understand every human is wired with the capacity that there's certain things that all of us will go through because you qualified to get a human body. Now, you're a spirit in a human body, and the human part of you, there are dynamics on this earth that the humanness of you, the human part, of you will go through because that's part of your requirements to have a human body. Everyone doesn't get one. Angels, demons long for human bodies. You and I have the grand privilege of having access to two worlds, the spiritual world and the physical world. Angels and demons, they don't have access to both worlds. Only the invisible. In order for them to be effective in the, in the physical world, they need a physical person to work through. You've heard me say all oh, my ministry. That's why God, that's why the devil, that's why angels, that's why demons look for human real estate because it's so valuable. We're thinking, man, I want to be an angel. Angels are saying, man, I want to be human. We are made. We are not angels. Humans are made in the image of God Almighty. And I can always tell that goes over people's head by the weak claps. If you understood that you are made, you understand you are made in the God class. And of course, think about it. If you were the devil and you had no more power and he really doesn't, and the only way he can get power is to deceive or to trick people who have it to release it to them, release it to him. If he can only get power that you have, then the number one thing he's going to do is convince you and me you're not anything but dust. In spite of the fact that the angels said to God, what is man? What is man that you're so mindful of him? What is it about him? It's amazing that the devil and demonic spirits know the value of who we are, and we don't. 
Why is that important? Because until you know who you are, you'll never be able to walk in what God has for you. And unfortunately, somebody like me will do your funeral. Most people never get to that reality and know what they have. And we're looking at the body in a casket, saying what life could have been. And I can imagine how it hurts God because every father wants their kid to grow and measure and have the maximum life they could have. But God is limited by what we believe. Isn't it amazing? Your belief can stop Almighty God. We know this for a fact because Jesus was in his hometown, Nazareth. I'm in my hometown. I know what it's like. You want to do a lot in your hometown. Jesus couldn't because they didn't believe God's hand was on him. I understand that. They think, well, that's a boy from a kid of school. I get all that. It's just part of it. But Jesus says, I could only do a few works here in Nazareth. He went all over Capernaum and all over Jerusalem and other places raising the dead. You understand? He raised the dead. But in his hometown, he could only do a few little miracles. Like a few people had codes that he could get rid of. Did he have less power in Nazareth? No, he had less belief. When are you going to get this? That if he can just get somebody in your house to believe, he can tear your house down. He can turn it around. And here's the cool thing. He doesn't need everybody. He just needs one person. Just one person. Is that amazing? Just one person can change everything. But you got to believe something, and it's all activated based on what Jesus did on the cross. And what did Jesus do on the cross? The one thing, and I want everybody to get this. I'm going to give you these seven keys real quick, and then I'm done. One of the things that happened on the cross, there's several, but one of the greatest things was it released the peace of God. The Bible says that peace we have, and it's here to guard our heart. Now, let me tell you, I don't have time to get in that. Today, that's part two. I'm going to invite you to come back because it will change your life because some of you are in the situation where you're going through a storm or battle or you will. Please believe me, you will or somebody in your family will. And the difference of that thing happening sooner or later has everything to do with you understanding the God peace that's in you because it is the peace of God in you. Listen to me. It's God's peace that creates manifestation of God's power quickly. In other words, if I can create an atmosphere of peace, I could speed up what God wants to do in my circumstances. Did you all hear what I just said? That what activates manifestation in the invisible? What causes God's promises to come in the physical sooner than later is the atmosphere that I create with the peace of God. If I want to see peace on the outside of me, I have to activate the peace of God that's supposed to rule my heart. And man, and I, I can't wait to unpack this and share this with you. I know what I'm talking about. Folks, you remember Peter? Peter is about to get executed. He's in prison. You got to read this story about Peter in the Bible. He's in prison. They're going to execute him in 24 hours. And the Bible says, Peter, this is the guy who denied Jesus, but he gets his life back on track and he understands the power of God and the peace of God. And now the peace of God is ruling. It's ruling his heart. So now he's, in, he's locked up in prison. They have him shackled. And in 24 hours, they're going to kill him. Execution. And the Bible says, get this, the peace of God was so strong in him, he went to sleep. What? Who wants to sleep and you're going to be executed tomorrow? You don't need sleep unless the peace of God is ruling. Wouldn't that be something that when you have bills due, the peace of God rules over your heart? And while everybody's saying what they want, you're going to lose this, we're going to do this, you go to sleep. Because God's peace is ruling your heart. Wouldn't that be cool in a, in a physical situation or, or when you're facing a sickness or when you're going through something the doctor says there's nothing they can do and you look at the doctor and there's so much peace coming from you and he says, well, what, do, do you need anything? No, I'm going to go home and I'm just going to relax. Yeah. Why? Because the peace of God rules. Not your, not your x-ray, not my bank account, not my friends, not my family. God's peace rules in my heart. Imagine if that's how you lived your life. 
Peter did that, and what happened? Before the morning, before the sun could shine, an angel stepped in there. Why did the angel come? Because the peace of God in your heart brings manifestation quickly of God's promises. That angel got there before the sun started shining because that's what peace, the peace of God will do. It brings the promises of God into manifestation quickly. Man, that angel got there, and you know the story. The Bible says that angel got there and woke Peter up. He's sleeping. He's going to be murdered. He's going to be executed. The next day, the angel said, hey, Pete, get up. Peter! Oh, what's up? Come on. I'm taking you out of here. Amen. Oh, that's cool. All right. And he goes out. And they're going, to, they're going to execute him because he was preaching. He goes right back out and preaches some more. Hallelujah. The peace of God. Now, I'm going to show you from Scripture. This is what we're going to unpack today and next week. I'm going to give you these steps. So you can start operating that when something comes in your life. You'll understand that just being mad is not a game plan. Just being depressed is not a game plan for victory. Just crying and texting everybody and telling everybody how they hurt you, that is not a game plan for the victory for you, your kids, or your family, or no one else. If you want victory, you have got to learn how to activate the peace of God that rules in your heart. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise, would you? So let's just look real quick at how this peace was released. We'll get into how to do it. But I want to show you these seven secrets from the cross because it leads to all these things that I want to deal with in this series real quick. So if you look at the scripture, the Bible says the seven, these are the seven last words of Jesus. And by the way, I have them all starting with an R to help you remember them so you can reflect on them when you leave here because that's what's really important to get this inside of you and never, ever forgive it. Forget it. I want somebody to just shout this with me. Say, I'm going from average to amazing. Just say it. Yeah, come on, folks. Just, just say it like you mean it. Just say it. Come on. Here's the first thing I want to give you. We get this in the scripture where it says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the first thing Jesus said on the cross. Uh, they'll pop these scriptures on the screen as I go through them. But he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a very powerful scripture. And when Jesus said that, you have to remember he's on a cross now. And what's kind of weird, they couldn't really kill him. He had to lay his life down because he had life. He was life rather than he, he didn't have it. He was it. So in order for them to kill it, he told them himself. He, he says, I'm laying my life down. But what was so cool, he's on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This deals with, would you write this somewhere? I'm going to show you these seven powers of the cross. The first one is the power of redemption. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He uttered those words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In this moment, now I'm going to give you quickly, I want you to jot this down. I'm going to tell you what he said, what it meant. I'm going to give you the principle, and then I'm going to give you one action step on each one of these seven things. So you can leave here today, and no matter what fa you face in life, these seven things covers everything in life. You all ready for this? Yeah. All right. So he looks at them, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the power of redemption. Say that with me, the power of redemption. Power of redemption. Come on, one more time. Ready? Go. Power now, the power of redemption, this is important, and let me give you the principle. The principle of redemption is this, that what you have is not earned through your own goodness, but through God's grace and his forgiveness. So what he was doing is saying right there on the cross, that you'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough for what God has. You can't earn God's goodness. But because God is good, he's going to forgive you. Man, that's so powerful to me. The action step is real simple. When you leave here, extend forgiveness to others as freely as God has forgiven you. I'm almost, I'm always amazed at how people find it so hard to forgive other people when God has forgiven them for all the secrets in their heart. I never get a strong cross when I talk like that, a clap when I talk like that. Don't worry about it. It's all right. 
Sometimes people can't clap. But I want you to walk away from here understanding the power of redemption. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But extend that, the action, forgive others freely. Just like God forgave you. And when you forgive people, I want you to think about all the stuff God knows about you. I tell people all the time, I don't interview people based on their successes. I want to know the secrets. That's how you'll know how strong somebody is or how weak they are. So you think about all the secrets you hold, and yet God woke you up this morning. Wow. The next verse, if you go in that sequential order, um, he looks at the thief, because there's a thief. Jesus is up there dying. There's a thief also. And the thief <clears throat> mentions to Jesus, remember me in paradise. And Jesus gives him this radical rebirth thought. He looks at him and he says, today thou should be with me in paradise. So the first one, that we dealt with, that deals with redemption, tells me I'm never going to be good enough, so I, I have to take God's, God at his word and receive his grace. This one here is really important because he looks at this thief. And don't look at the thief. The thief is about to die. He's on a cross. They got nails in the guy's hands and feet, and Jesus has nails in his hands and feet, and they're talking. That, to me, is amazing. And the guy recognizes something on Jesus and said, just, just remember me when you go in your paradise. And Jesus said to him, thou shalt be with me in paradise. This is the second power. Would you write this down? It's the power of rest. The power of rest. Why do I say that? Because when he says paradise, you have to understand, yes, he's talking about this man was going to be saved. But I want everybody who's saved to hear me. We have something more than just being saved so when we die, we can go somewhere. We're not just saved, but we are safe while we live also. And a lot of people miss that. They, they think, I'll be, when I die, I'm saved. Yeah, but while you're alive, Jesus died to give rest so that you can be safe while you're alive as well. And so the principle here is Jesus, through his power, wants us to find rest in the midst of of any chaos. Listen to me. There's nothing anointed that can hit your life that you are not more than anointed to overcome. I don't care what, listen to me, I don't care what you are going through or what you'll ever face. Nothing, nothing can hit your life that you are not more anointed than that thing to get victory. And, yeah, and if you're facing something, or the next time you face it, you should look right at that thing and say, yeah, you look big, you look bad, you look tough, but I want you to know with everything you have, you still don't have enough anointing on you to defeat my life. You'll be with me in paradise. That's what he's talking about, that you're, listen, that in every problem, there's a paradise waiting for you. So what's the action when you leave here today? It's real simple. The action when you walk out of here, trust God's power to turn your problems into peace. Start trusting God's power that when you face a problem, I want you to start saying to the problem, you must turn in to peace. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but problem, you will turn into peace. Give me a big amen, somebody. Amen. Third thing, the Bible says, Jesus, he's on the cross. He's John 19. He looks at his mother, and he says the most strangest thing. He says, woman, behold thy son. Man, that's tough there. And he's, she's looking at her son, and uh, he, he, he says, woman, behold thy son. And, of course, here's the principle. He's saying, in your life, you're going to have to understand the goodness of God's grace. That's when we talk about redemption. That, that's how you and I have to look at it. That that's what redemption is, God's grace. Then we have to enter into, we're going to have problems in life, everybody. How do I handle problems? 
have to rest in him, believing my problems would turn into peace. And now he comes to the power, the number three power, and that's the power of revelation, the power of relationships. He's showing us in life. You're gonna have, if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to understand God's redemption, that you are not good enough to measure God. You can't, me- you can't be up there with God, so God is going to forgive you because you can't, and he's going to meet you where you are. Man, I love that about God. And then everybody's going to have problems. He's on the cross saying, here's, this, here's what everybody's going to go through. There's going to be problems. <clears throat> you have problems because you're human. I have problems because I grew up here. You have problems because you're a human being. We have problems because we don't have the money. To say. You have problems because you're a human. And every human experience problems. I don't care how much money you have or what color you are, where you are. Yes, other pe- people go through other things because of people's silliness on earth. But everybody on earth that has a body will experience problems. So how do you deal with your problems? You look at your problems and say, your problems you are going to turn into peace. That's what we're talking about. Then he goes to this, the power of relationship. What's the principle there? Prioritize. Prioritize meaningful relationships and make sure that you put people over profits and relationships over rewards. What is he doing? He's looking at his mother. And he's telling his brothers, take care of my mother, take care of my mother and all this. But he's focusing on the cross. The worst time in his life. And he's telling us, he's telling us, get your relationship issues correctly. And I know this because I'm at the deathbed of people, and I'm telling you, everybody, everybody talks about just people, nothing else. I'm sorry I did this to her. I wish I wouldn't do that. Man, I should have been a better father. I should have been a better mother. Man, what I did to my wife, what I did to my husband, what I did to my mom, what I did, everybody. And everybody. And if you're not careful, let me tell you, the enemy will mess you up, and you'll do something in a relationship, and it'll be that one thing, the one thing that the rest of your life it marks you with. So you have to be, anybody hear what I'm talking about? So you have to be careful and understand that the Lord is saying, if you're going to have victory, you have to understand the value of relationships. You can't keep burning bridges. You can't keep looking at people as if they have no value. That no profit should come before a person. Your rewards are not greater than your relationships. That's what he's saying. Focus on those. What's the action plan? It's real simple. When you leave here, invest time and effort in nurturing and valuing your relationship with your friends and loved ones. That's what you should do this Easter. Nurturing. In other words, thinking, every time I get together, I fight because I want to be right. I want to argue. I don't care who's right. I just want us to value the fact that we're still here. And why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. They were interviewing me not too long ago. This is uh, some pastors up in Pasadena. I'm on, I'm on uh, Zoom, and they're interviewing me. And the guy is asking, I'm with some other pastors, and they Zoomed in from different places, and they're asking all these pastors, what's the one thing about ministry that's so significant to you, and what stands out? And everybody was doing these deep things. And man, I'm thinking they're so deep. They're coming to me. I think, i got to think of a scripture. What can I say? And, and nothing would resonate. And, so I just thought, well, I'm just going to tell it like it is. So they came to me, and they said, what's the one thing about the people in your church, about people you meet as a pastor that's so significant? I said, you know, be honest, here's the one thing. Is that everybody has an expiration date. That's affected me more than anything. Because I wanted to know what's the greatest thing that affected you in ministry, the one thing. I said, it's that, that everybody I look at, I know. There's going to be a day when it's their last day that everybody has an expiration date. And I was telling them my value in people, I've learned to look at it that way. And the terrible thing, I don't know if that expiration date is today or tomorrow or next week. But I've seen in many people's lives that I thought it was going to be longer and it wasn't. So I, I do my best. I'm not, I don't do it 100% all the time. I do work hard at it. And it's very difficult for people. I, don't, I, I can know somebody who has did me dirty dog wrong, and I'm telling you, this understanding of the value of a person that there's an expiration date causes me to look at them different all the time. So maybe that's something you might want to start understanding when you talk to your mom, your dad, your kids, your brothers, your sister, your neighbors, everybody. 
I go to my daily place where I get my Starbucks, and I'm always looking at the person. He's just so friendly. Of course, they know me because I'm there all the time. And just the other day, I'm looking at the guy thinking, wow, there's an expiration date. What can I say? What can I do to make a difference for him today? So the action step is simple. Invest time and effort, nurturing and valuing your relationship with your friends and family. Number four, we're almost done, is the power of reversal. I get this because it's so powerful here. He's on the cross. And all of a sudden, he turns this despair where it looks like a total separation forever. He turns it around. This is the fourth thing when he's on the cross. And I love this because this principle here is an action step. And Jesus goes into this, and you don't understand why he, he says, I'm thirsty. You don't, but you don't understand why, but if you look at the order in which he's saying things, he starts with our relationship with God, then he goes to the relationship where he talks about with people. He says, get all this straight. Then he goes into something that's huge here. What number is this for us? This is number four. Yeah. And he talks about this, this incredible exchange, this incredible act that he demonstrates here. And the reason I love this is because this power of reversal shows us how everything in our life was changed. This really is the thing, in my opinion, this number four, it's the thing that really convinced me that I need to do everything I can to live my life for God now because when this is over, um, I'm not willing to take my chances. You know, some people say, what if, what if it's not real? In the back of my head, I always think, yeah, that's pretty good, but what if it is? So that is a stronger, that resonates stronger with me. But Jesus is, he's, he's, feeling, he's feeling terrible. And he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And right after that, he says he's thirsty. When he says, why have thou forsaken me? Now, out of all the things on the cross, when he said that, that's when you see how bad this death was when his own father had to turn his back on him. Because you understand, when somebody sins, according to God's word, God can never lie. And he says, if somebody sins, a price has to be paid. Here's what the cross is all about. When Jesus yelled, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He was telling us, he was showing us this great reversal that I'm talking about, the power of reversal. But this reversal is this. Every human being was supposed to pay for their own sins. Jesus says, God, I will pay for everybody. Put everybody's sins on me. One man brought sin on everyone, Adam. He was sinless. So it had to be another man without sin to take all sins back. And no human qualified. This is why Jesus had to be born. And he couldn't just come from heaven. He had to come through the mother's womb to qualify as a human on earth. And he had to grow up in the same situation that you and I grew up in order to tell us you can live this way. He can't come here as God and tell me as a human to live my life right. When Jesus says you can do this, it's because he did it. He had people laugh at him, talk about him, do all kind of crazy things. He had temptations. He had everything you and I went through as a man. The Bible says when he died, it was Christ the man that died. Because you can't kill God. The point I'm making is that great exchange is what happened Every sin of every human being, yours, mine, everyone, sins were transferred to Jesus at that moment. Just like every sin was transferred to Adam. When Adam sinned, you understand, when a person's born in this world, they come with a mark of sin, even if they do nothing wrong. You can be the perfect person in your family. You're a sinner because you were born with the mark of Adam. That's why you'd be reborn and accept Jesus, and then that mark of Adam is removed, and you get the mark of Jesus because you're born again. He took our sins. Adam gave us his mark. On the cross, Jesus said, I'll pay the price. So he felt the torture and the punishment that every single human that's ever sinned would have felt. He felt it. This is why the Bible says it wasn't just they beat him so bad, but he was beat with our sins. 
and God had to forsake him. And that is when Jesus yelled, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Now, what is that great reversal? The reversal is what makes you and I justified. That's a Bible term. It's a spiritual legal term. Justification. Justify, just as if I'd. Justify. Just as if I'd never sinned. So here it is. Jesus is here. Here's the exchange. Here's the reversal. All of our sins come to him. My God, why have thou forsaken me? He could feel the sins and everything that should have judged us, judged him. And he took it. He stayed on the cross until every last sin was paid. And then his goodness, his righteousness, all of his righteousness was taken and reversed. His righteousness was reversed and came unto man. And man's sins were reversed and came on to him. So now he's there with our sins. We walk away with his righteousness. Wow. And in case you have forgotten the reason God loves you, the reason he answers your prayers, the reason he's so good to you, it's not because you know Bible verses, it's not because you sing, it's not because you preach, it's not because on Easter you come to church. God deals with you and rescues you because he sees righteousness when he looks at you. Where did that righteousness come from? The reversal. He doesn't look at you and see the sin that you did at 15 and 16 and 18 and in the back of a house or in the back of the car or in anywhere. He sees the righteousness of God on your life. Wow. Wow. That is the reversal. And that's why you and I are able to deal with the God that's so holy. I know you thought, well, I fast 40 days. Your little 40-day fast won't get you close to God. <laughs> it's the reversal. That's what does it. So the principle there is through Christ, our sins are exchanged. I get his righteousness. He gets my sins. I'm justified. Say, just as if I never sinned. Say it. Just as if I never sinned. Say, I'm justified. Come on, tell me it's hard to say it. I know it, but just say it. Don't worry. Stop looking at what you did. Look at what he did. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. Stop looking at what you did. Look at what he did. And if you start living your life by what he did, it'll change what you did. All right. Somebody shout, I'm justified. I'm justified. So here's the action. Live in the reality of being made righteous in Christ, free from guilt and free from the burden of sin. I dare you to leave here today and treat people like, wow, I'm justified. Let me ask you a question. If I'm justified, do you think, and I believe that, do you think I'll treat you different than if I thought I'm a guilty old no good sinner? I'm gonna treat you different because the way I look at me is the way I look at you. Let me bring this to a close. Number five, he says, I thirst. That was the power of rescue. This signifies the power, and I love this. Notice he goes from the relationship now to this exchange. Here's why you can do it. And then he says, here's one of the things you can do. He says, I thirst. So what is he talking about now? And now he's dealing with my appetites, my addictions, and my bondage. And he is saying, what he did on the cross helps you get free from those appetites and addictions and bondages that you have. That's what he says. That's what he says. So what the principle there is I can get free from every worldly bondage. Nothing can hold you down if you want to get free. And so what is the action step? It's simple. When you leave here, no matter what appetite, no matter what addictions, no matter what bondage that you face, you must see yourself having authority to walk free from those bondages. Yes, Lord. Because it does, listen to me, listen, it doesn't matter 
what God believes. It only matters what you believe about what God said. Number six, we're almost done. And I love this one. This here deals with the power of restoration because he says it's finished. And I love this because he's up there on the cross and he yells, it is finished. And I love that because he didn't say, I am finished. He didn't say, I didn't do it. He didn't say, I almost finished. He didn't say, to be continued. <laughs> no, he says, it is finished. Wow. What's finished, he is saying, what man messed up in the Garden of Eden, I've restored it. Everything that needs to be restored to bring man back in a position of dominion, it is finished. You, you have to look at your life and understand this is so powerful because here's the principle that you are fully restored. You're no longer a slave, but an heir. Slaves get nothing. You're an heir to God. The benefits that God set up belong, belongs to his heirs. And when Jesus said it's finished, he had to die because he was putting a covenant in place. And anybody that knows anything about legal covenants that deals with anybody receiving benefits, after someone dies, the person has to die. The benefits don't kick in. There's certain benefits that only kick in after death. The moment Jesus died, one of the benefits was the peace of God we're going to talk about next week. But the other benefits were these seven benefits. These seven powers entered into you and me when Jesus died because what released the covenant to the beneficiaries, us, was the, the person setting this up had to die. And I love this about Jesus. He died so that we could be the beneficiaries. And then three days later, he was resurrected to make sure we got our benefits. That's a pretty good deal. So, what is significant about it's finished? What's significant is that when he said it's finished, you and I gain victory to the promises of God. Here's the action step. Embrace and own your identity. You are an heir to God's grace. You are an heir to God's grace. Part of the grace that God gives us is that peace that I'm going to talk about next week. I want you to say, I'm an heir to God's grace. I'm an heir to God's grace. Now say it like you mean to say, I'm an heir to God's grace. I'm an heir to God's grace. Now here's what I want you to do when you walk out of here today. I don't care what hits you. I don't care what thoughts, what comes in your mind. I want you to remember that, and I want you to speak back to that situation and say, I'm an heir to God's grace. And you start practicing that. You start speaking that to situations, even to your own thoughts. And I'll guarantee you, you'll start an incredible authority being released from your life. But you have to first start with your identity, knowing who you are, because it doesn't matter what you have, where you go, it's who you believe you are. And the moment you believe you're an heir, then the forces of darkness will treat you like an heir. The Bible says when the Israelites are going to the promised land, they looked at each other and said, oh, we look like grasshoppers to these giants. And the scripture says, the way they saw themselves, the way they saw themselves is the way the enemy saw them. You want to know how the devil sees you? How do you see you? You walk in as an heir, that's how we, what he sees. If you walk in like, well, I don't, never know what's going to happen, that's what he sees. Let me close with this last one, and it's number seven. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And of course, this is powerful because this deals with the principle of a rulership. His last words, I, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I, I, I'm, I'm giving this to you. This deals with the principle of access to our benefits, that we now can access the benefits. But what should we do? What's our action plan? Trust God that his provisions and his benefits are for people who have his covenant. You and I are covenant people. When he stretches hands, he says, I give you my spirit. I love this because... You always give people, you know, if you're getting ready to, I know when I was a kid, you know, we had those little street fights. You take everything out your pocket, tell your best friend, hold this, man. You hold this. You're taking stuff off. Why? Right? Because right? you're getting ready to get busy. And that's what Jesus is doing. 
I'm going to put my spirit in your hand, Father. Here, you hold this. You hold this, because I'm getting ready to get busy. And then, of course, he dies, but he doesn't just lay in a cold grave. He goes to the underworld, and he meets Satan. And the Bible says he made a show of him openly, meaning Satan was having a party at the time Jesus said it's finished, because Satan was blindsided. We know this because the Bible says, had the devil known what he was doing, he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. So Jesus showed up and knocked on the door. When they opened the door, the demons thought, ah, it's him. <laughs> and Jesus comes in there and interrupts their party, and the Bible says he make a show of the devil. You understand what that means? In front of all the party folks that's going on, the devil's talking about what he just did. He's surprised. How are you here when you're screaming up there? And Jesus showed up, and the Bible said he made a show of him. In other words, Jesus didn't just rest in the grave. He took care of business with the underworld and defeated everything that Satan thought he had. And the Bible says he made a show of him. And the Bible says it was as if God made him armless. I want you to imagine he's going around like this now. He's just trying to mess with you like this. And that's the attitude the Lord wants us to have. And so I want you to have that attitude. Now remember, if the devil had power to stop you, he would have stopped you already. Remember the last time he came at you and backed you up? How in the world did you get out of that? He couldn't keep you. He, do you think you'd be here this morning, all the crazy stuff he put you through in your, in your right mind? Are you kidding me? He tried to stop you years ago. Why couldn't he stop you? Because he couldn't. Because there's something in you greater than what's in him. And when you understand this and you start embracing it intentionally instead of by accidentally, then you walk in a different dominion. And now you start creating the type of life you want instead of having to endure the type of life the enemy's creating. And it makes all the difference in the world. I want everybody to stand, if you will. Thank you for joining us this Easter Sunday. We went over a little bit of our time. Okay, we went over a lot of bit of our time today. It's Easter. You all are going to enjoy the rest of this day. I hope you do. We certainly are. I know many of you will have meals with your family and times. Remember these seven things. These are seven things, seven powers that will forever change your life. And you can watch these again on all our social media outlets. Now I'm going to pray for all of you. I want you to just stretch your hands towards me. In fact, just put both hands over your heart. I'm going to pray. No one moving. No one leaving. Just be respectful just for a second. Hands over your heart. I'm going to pray. Just before I pray, I wonder how many of you say, Pastor Lonnie, you were talking to me this morning, and I want you to include me in this prayer. I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Maybe you have, but you don't even remember. Or maybe you did and it wasn't real. You're saying, Pastor Lonnie, this morning, would you include me in this closing prayer? I'd like to make Jesus the Lord of my life right here on Easter Sunday morning. Just include me in your closing prayer. If that's you, Pastor, if that's you, would you do that? So you're, by, by you acknowledging, you're saying, Pastor, include me in this closing prayer. All right, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you would say that, Pastor, I've never accepted Christ as my Savior. I didn't know I had to. Maybe you even baptized, but you don't remember doing, you don't remember accepting Christ. You're saying, Pastor, include me in this prayer. All right, if that's you, I want you to just quickly slip your hand up and put it right back down, and I will include you in this prayer, I promise you, before I close. If that's you, Pastor, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. There's another one. I see you. Thank you. I see you. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. I see you. Thank you. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. I remember I was 17 years old when I did this very thing. I said, Pastor, include me in this prayer. I want to know that I know. I'd rather be 100% sure than to miss it. Here's about eyes are closed. Christians are praying. Anybody else before I close in prayer? Pastor, would you include me in this prayer? I see you, ma'am. I see you. I see you. Another hand. I see you. I see you way in the back. I see you. Yeah, it takes courage. I see you. Yeah, I see you. I tell you the greatest things you ever the greatest thing you ever do for yourself and your family is put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because you're gonna find out one day He's the only one that can bring you through certain things. Here's a bowed eyes are still closed. I have another invitation for you real quick before I pray. You're here, you're saying, Pastor Lonnie, I am a Christian. I prayed that prayer. I know that I know if I died right now, there's not a doubt in my mind I'm going to heaven. But I haven't been living for God and today. On Easter Sunday, I want to rededicate my life back to God. Would you include me in that prayer as well, Pastor? Because today, 
I don't want to go any, I don't want to go a step further. I want to rededicate my life back to God. If that's you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just quickly slip your hand up and put it back down. In this prayer, I'll include you. Okay, I see you. I see you in the back. I see you. Pastor, include me in this prayer. I see you. I see you. I, I see you. You're just saying, Pastor, it's not that you're real bad, but you know you got off track. You just, or you just haven't been living the way you know God wants you to live. You're saying, Pastor, include me in this prayer. I want to make sure I rededicate my life to Christ. Heads about, eyes closed. Any others before I close in prayer? I see you. Any others? I see you. I see you. All right? Heads about, eyes are closed. I have one, another invitation that I'm going to give you. You're here, you're saying, Pastor, I'm not a member of any local church. Or maybe you are, but you're not growing. After being here in this atmosphere, you can feel the power. You can... You can understand the teaching and you think, wow, I could grow in a place like this. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'd love to be your pastor. I'd love to help make God's dream in your life come to pass. And so being here this morning, you said, Pastor Lonnie, I'd like to become a member of this church. I believe I can grow here. Would you include me in your closing prayer? I really would like to be a member here. If that's you, heads about, eyes are closed. Would you quickly just slip one of your hands up so I can see it? And I'll include you in this prayer as well. Okay, I see you there. There's another one. Quickly, I see you there in the back. Any other hands? Pastor, I'd like to become a member here. I'm not a member of any local church, or maybe you've been coming here, but you haven't made a commitment to be a member. Any others? Quickly, before I pray, that is my last invitation, and then I will pray. All right? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Christians are praying. All right, I'm going to pray just like I promised you. Now, this is such an incredible moment right now, and I want everybody to be praying. If you have loved ones here, this is a great moment for you to just, in your own heart, thank God for what he's about to do. Now, in just a second, I'm going to pray for everybody just like I promised. I'm going to count to three before I pray, and then here's what I'm going to do. When I count to three, I'm going to ask every single person, listen to me closely, every single person that raised their hand for any one of those three invitations, or maybe you didn't because you were a little embarrassed or scared, but you know God's talking to your heart then I want to include you on this as well because I don't want anybody to miss out. But when I count to three, I'm going to ask every single person, by the time I get to three, if you raise your hand for any of those invitations, I'm going to ask you to come down to this altar so I can pray for you just like I promised. And let me tell you why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to put anybody in the spot. Here's why I'm doing it. The Bible says that Jesus said these words. He says, if you're ashamed of me before people, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. He died for you openly. He wants you to openly stand for him. And when I have people come down to this altar, you're not going to say anything. I'm just going to pray for you as a promise. But it is your way of saying to the Lord, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not embarrassed of you. I'm not embarrassed to make a decision for you. You stood up for me. I'm standing up for you. That's what this is all about. So we call it the walk of faith. Where you put your chest up and you walk down because you are proud of the decision you made. So I'm going to count to three. One. When I get to three, I'm going to tell you right now, as I'm speaking, there's voices coming to you saying, oh, you don't really need to do that. You don't need to. You have to ignore all those voices because remember, the voice that you trust is the most important thing in your life. Two, get ready. When I get to three, and I'm telling you, if you, just, you, as fast as you can, if you just take that step, the power of God is going to touch your life and it's going to be the first day to new level of victory. So for whatever invitation I gave you, if you raise your hand or you didn't, and you know you wanted to, I want you to also come down here. Here we go. Three. Come quick. Come on down to the altar. Come on, people. Clap your hand as these folks come. Come on, people. Beautiful. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Beauty. Beautiful. Come on. Come on. Beautiful, sir. Come on! Beautiful! Yeah! Come on, folks! Come on, folks! Beautiful! Woo! Yeah! Beauty! 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 Now, on all of you down here, look at me. Everybody look at my, look at my eyes. Let me tell you. Today, mark this day. Something's going to shift in your life like you've never had come on you before. For some, 
you're going to feel it. For others, you're going to see it. But for every single person, something's going to enter into you at a whole other dimension. I don't think this. I know this. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Just one. Believe what I'm telling you. Because all things are possible to him that believes. That whatever situation you have faced, I'm telling you today, it starts to change. Just believe it. I know it. I want you to believe it. Now I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask everybody in the church to pray this prayer with me. I'm going to cover all three of the invitations in this one prayer. So no matter what you raise your hand for, it will cover one of those three invitations. And then, everybody down here is real important. Our team is going to have you feel something out because I'm going to, I want to send you all, if you accept a Christ the first time, I want to send you the seven things to do right after you pray this prayer I want to give you. The rest of you, I'm going to send you, it's a 21 day. It's a 21 day. Every single day, you're going to do just one of those things for 21 days. So after 21 days, you can reprogram your whole mind. It's one spiritual pillar action that you're going to do based on God's words, like a little Bible study for 21 days to help reshape your life in this decision. All right? So I want everybody, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to stretch your right hand towards these people. Just stretch your, yeah, everybody, just your right hand. Now, all of you, out of love and respect for God, I want you to stretch, if not both, at least one of your hands up towards the heaven because that's where your help is coming from. Not from me, it's coming from above. God is using me to release something in you, but that's where your help is coming from. Now, when everybody together, pray this prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven forgive, me for my sins. forgive me for my sins. I acknowledge, I acknowledge. I'll, never be I'll never be good enough. Therefore, Therefore I, accept I accept your goodness. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm, a I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Right now, right, now. Right, here. right here, save me. Save me. I, make a I make a conscious decision. And I ask you, Jesus, ask you, Jesus. come into my heart. Come into my, come into my life. Come into my life. From, this on, From this moment on, if you can do anything with my life, with my life it, belongs it belongs to you. I commit to you. Commit to you. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Fill, me now fill me now with your power. Give me the ability to walk in this victory. In the name of Jesus, I receive the free gift of salvation. The benefits of the cross are now mine. By faith, I receive them. Victory has come to my house. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I thank you so much for these wonderful people. I thank you for those who are rededicating their life to you. They're drawing a line in the sand, and they're saying enough is enough. I thank you for those that have come to be a member of this church. May the anointing and grace on this house rest on their house. They'll never be the same. I give you all the praise, and I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, just clap your hands, everybody. Just stay right there and clap your hands. Come on, folks. All right. Now, all of you down here, listen. Where, where are, okay, Pastor Dan, come on around here. Before you all leave, our pastors, just make your way in front, pastors. They're going to start handing you a card. You, if you want, you can take the card back to your seat, but make sure you bring it back before you leave, because I want to make sure the things I promise you, as long as you have an email on there so I can get stuff to your phone number, I'm going to make sure you get everything that I promised. Because today, I'm telling you, today is the day of a new beginning for your life. You'll see it. All right. Do not leave this altar until they give you a card or something, okay? Be sure. Our pastors, you guys will quickly come up and assist. Quickly, all of our pastors. And pastors, mates, because we're going to probably need your help. Come on up. Bring... Yep, and if they run out of cards, just have them just jot it on something. Come on, come on, help. Yep, we need you. Yep, 
Come on, both of you. Yep, come on up. We'll, we'll use you. All right. Please do not leave the altar until they give one of these for you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Your loved ones will be here. You all are dismissed. Thank you for coming.